Good morning, everyone and Karen. Uh, welcome to this week's um, very exciting TechSoup Connect. Um, just before we before we start today, I have some compulsory slides that I must share with you, um, which uh, just talk about what TechSoup Connect is all about. So let's share my screen and just go through the thing. So welcome to the South Australia and NT chapter of TechSoup Connect. Um, we, uh, so Kat and I are your local TechSoup Connect event organizers. Um, in case I haven't said TechSoup enough, you'll notice that this is a program of TechSoup. Uh, TechSoup is a um, nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get, implement, and use technology effectively. Um, and TechSoup Connect is a global meetup of Tech for Good, global network of Tech for Good meetups. So the idea is connecting the IT and the, the digital sector with the nonprofit sector um, to try and get good social outcomes for all. The TechSoup Connect global network is truly global. We have 128 cities in 41 countries, um, different sort of engagement rates in all of those groups, but um, a definite global network. And if you've been onto our Facebook page, you'll notice that our, our lead, Eli, occasionally shares uh, these sessions from other groups um, just to try and share some, some global knowledge. So the values here at TechSoup Connect, uh, we welcome everyone. Uh, we put community first. So we're here to support each other. Um, we build stronger nonprofits, and technology is one of the tools that we use to do that. Um, we invite participation. Uh, we believe everyone has something to learn and uh, something that they can teach and, and contribute. And we also treat each other with kindness and respect. We always are on the lookout for people to help with um, TechSoup Connect, whether that's helping us run events, whether it's helping us promote the events to, to boost the attendance over time, whether it's the welcoming crew, so this very important job that I'm doing right now. Um, anyone can plan an event. Um, just message the, message the Facebook page or reach out to Kat and I and we'd be happy to take on volunteers. Now, in Australia, if you haven't heard of TechSoup, uh, you might have heard of Connecting Up. Connecting Up is essentially the, the TechSoup partner or the TechSoup agent in Australia. Um, and the program that TechSoup and Connecting Up are most well known for is their technology donation and discount program, um, which is part of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, it's about being able to get technology through um, donations from these IT providers um, rather than paying for retail whack for your software, um, which is one of the ways that we can extend your budget quite a bit further. Now, if you need any technology help in between these um, TechSoup Connect events, you can jump on forums.techsoup.org um, and find answers to pretty much any digital type question. Um, and that's an international audience there, but a lot of, a lot of US-centric organizations. The sponsors for this chapter of TechSoup Connect are Refuel Creative, which is my business, and Create Your Change, which is Kat's business. Okay, so today's guest, really important guest today. Is us. Um, it's us. <laughs> And um, when we were planning out the, the schedule for the year, um, we felt like getting into tax time was a really good time to, to start to look at a topic like this. Um, I've found historically that lots of nonprofits kind of don't know what normal is um, and, they would, and they need a bit of a guide on what normal is and, uh, and what they should be looking at. So um, I have uh, some slides that I've got from um, talking about some case studies. 
Um, but I think if we can start with opening up any questions that you might have, um, if we can start to fill up the, the chat and the, the Q&A so we can get a bit of an idea of, of what you're looking to get answered today. Um, I'll just start my slides again. Anything else you want to cover before I get into it, Kat? Nope, I'm good to jump in, especially to answer any questions that may be coming up. Awesome. All right. So, share my screen again. So let's talk about your IT budget and your not-for-profit, um, and in particular, how we can look to leverage different programs that are available to benefit your organization. So we have some common IT problems that most nonprofits have. Um, there's some reasons why things have changed and why we're talking about how we can lower our cost of ownership over our technology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about software and systems that are very common, computers and hardware, um, even your IT support, and then a, a couple of case studies moving forward. So what is your problem? I'm going to ask you, <laughs> ask those on the call, but these are the, these are the common issues that we find when we talk to nonprofits. Um, cost is generally the biggest issue that comes across. Mm -hmm. Um, but people have issues with computers, they have issues with, with backups, or they have issues with backups that they don't know that they have until they go use the backups. Yeah. Uh, downtime, um, even IT support. Uh, most nonprofits don't have the luxury of having in-house IT. Um, and even those that do have in-house IT, depending on the size of the organization, quickly find that the in-house IT runs out of capacity. So these are the most common issues that we've encountered over time. But feel free to let us know if you've got any others that you want to chat about. So uh, let's talk about what's new here and what's, what's changing with budgets. So um, there is new technology that's available to help with the cost effectiveness of our technology. So. The biggest thing there is a lot of this pay per user type licensing. So that allows us to scale our pricing up and down to suit our funding agreements. So if you have a program that um, comes to the end, the staff's contracts have come to an end, you're not stuck with this investment in additional licenses that you need for those people. We can drop those costs back down until we get a new funding agreement and we can boost that back up. Can I ask a question, Ryan? Sure. So I know a lot of programs have gone to like a cloud-based format and want a monthly subscription. For example, say Microsoft Office. Okay. Um, what is the benefit of, ha of have having an ongoing subscription versus just buying the program outright? So say spending $300 for the program versus $39 a month. So the, the big difference is the, the capital investment. So $300 for a single license of office isn't really that bad. Um, and the, we're going to talk about how you can get it for less than that later. But if you had to buy 100 licenses at $300 a head, um, that's a very large capital expense. So if you have the option of paying that as a as a one-off, you may or may not have the, um, the funds to do that. So if the options then presented to you that you could buy those 100 licenses at $2 a month, that becomes a lot more affordable for those organizations. Right, um, I know people have asked me about that in the past and had the feeling is like, okay, you know, I understand that it may be less in the short term, but after a certain point, it actually costs more than buying it outright. That That's definitely true, but if, you look at if you look at it from the perspective of an organization that does let's say an it upgrade every five years so in the in the first two or three years they're getting their software updates on their software and you know they're getting two years is about the tipping point so if you per, if you obtain microsoft office as a donation through connecting up and you paid let's say 50 dollars a head for your license 
Um, and then you looked at the cost of buying it through the Microsoft Office 365 nonprofits program. Mm -hmm. um, two years is basically the amount of time you need to get payback. Um, so if you're one of those organizations that keeps their licenses for two years, the cost model is pretty much the same. Okay. Thank you. There is, there is some flexibility for the individual users. Um, you know, the office uh, online licenses are multi-device for each user. So they can put it on their tablet, they can put it on their home computer and things like that. Um, but in terms of the, the licenses through connecting up their per device, and they have to sit on the device. Um, but the big thing that we find is if you're an organization that holds your licenses for longer than that, you will achieve cost savings from buying the licenses outright, but that comes at the cost of productivity. Um, because you end up being on a, you're, you're basically a version behind on Office at that point. Right, okay. You're not necessarily getting the updates that you should. If you're not doing your, um, if you're not doing your IT upgrades every three years, you're going to start to find that performance has, has decreased. The um, people that are uh, using your computers are less efficient and effective. So you're losing money in all these other ways. Mm. Um, and that brings me to my second point there about decreasing downtime. Um, if you've got one of those IT environments that's lumbering along and it's you know four years old, you probably are experiencing quite a bit more downtime than you otherwise would. Um, so the, the paper user model we find, you know, there's, there's productivity benefits, there's feature benefits which increase staff collaboration and productivity, um, but it's just that capital investment. Um, you know, some organisations might have got a grant so that they could put a new server in and they got this whiz-bang flash $25,000 server, um, but then when it comes to three years later and that server's end of life, the organization may not have the same funding that they had at the time. Mm -hmm. So they can't afford, or they've got less staff, so they can't afford to replace that server. Um, so moving to the cloud makes a lot more sense there. Yeah. You know, and then um, the new technology enabling increased staff collaboration and productivity, it's really empowering what we're talking about here in terms of um, before we started the recording, we were talking about work from home and um, you know, flexible options to, to work in different locations. Um, there's lots of different opportunities to do that on a, um, on cloud type technology. Um, so that's, I guess the, the new technology that's available that helps us to decrease those costs. Um, but off the back of that as well, there's also new IT support models that have become available. Um, you know, some of us are used to having the, the IT provider that comes in and they do a, um, you know, it's an hour here or an hour there, um, or they, they're charging you in your 15-minute your blocks. And when you're on that kind of IT support model, people get worried about whether they can or can't ring the IT provider. You know, can we afford to do this? You know, we haven't budgeted for this ad hoc issue. Um, so these new support models are more around like per user or per device based IT support. So um, the, the principle is you, you might pay $50 per user per month for your IT support, which might seem, might seem like a bit, of, uh, a bit of money, but it's basically a guaranteed amount that you're spending every month knowing that that provider is maintaining your environment. Um, and basically, if the IT provider is doing their maintenance correctly and they're keeping your, your system well maintained, they may not have to do very much work every month. Um, if they're not doing a good job, um, then you'll probably be on the phone constantly to them and they'll be losing a lot of money out of the, out of the deal. So it's, it's kind of, it's a win-win for both parties because they have, a, they have a vested interest in making sure your environment is as good as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but you also know that you're not going to have any budget surprises along the way. It's sort of like IT insurance. Almost, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a, 
that's a good way to, to do that. I'm going to steal that. Um, <laughs> and so, and then the the other thing there is that there's substantial cost savings to be had. So you can get a lot of your technology as donations. There's a lot of IT providers or a lot of software companies now that are providing discounts as well. Um, almost everybody provides some form of nonprofit um, donation, discount, or incentive. Um, all you've got to do is ask. So let's look at the alternatives to your server. So the two most common oral alternatives here are Microsoft Office 365 and Google G Suite. And if we look at this in terms of what has the most usage in nonprofits, Office 365 has been the, the favorite in the nonprofit world. Um, and the reason for that is simply my fifth dot point there about the data stored in Australia. Um, and that provides a lot, of, a lot of certainty and reassurance to a lot of organizations. Um, but if you look at the storage limits, Office 365 also gives you more storage. Um, and we generally find that if you're transitioning from Office desktop apps, then Office 365 is a bit more familiar to users as well. Now, is G Suite the same as Google Workspace? Uh, yep. Because I think, yeah, I think they just updated the the name. Yeah, yeah. but they, they're still, both names are still out there at the moment, so we'll, we'll use both for now. Um, the feature set is very similar. I think the, the biggest difference to me, other than the data being stored in Australia, is that Microsoft Office, if you use the Pro Plus add-on, you get a copy of the, the desktop version of Office, um, which is all connected in with the cloud and all pretty handy. Um, but using that desktop license gives you a bit more familiarity. Mm. Um, and I, I've got to say 100% of the nonprofits that we've worked with have used Pro Plus to um, keep that desktop familiar desktop usage. Um, Google is great and Google is what we use here at, at Refuel, um, but it doesn't have that same familiarity in terms of the desktop software. Mm -hmm. um, but as you'll see there, both of them are available for free as donations from Microsoft or Google respectively. Um, and then Microsoft have got some paid upgrades that you can do. Google are the same. They've got some paid upgrades, but most organizations that adopt Google haven't felt the need to pay for those updates. Yeah, I think for a nonprofit just straight up doing it, it's like $6 a month per user. For what? Sorry? For Google. For Google? For Google Workspace. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually just transitioned to that with my business, and I'm still trying to figure out how to get it all set up, and I think it's like $6 a month. Yeah, well, it, it's... $8, $8 a month now, I think. Um, and we are on the, the business plan. So we get unlimited storage, but in, ter in exchange, we pay $17 a user a month. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just me. So it's not, uh, I get to yeah. pay a month. <laughs> I think if, if I had to, um, if I could get both of these for free, I'd probably be using Office 365. Yeah. Um, but since we have to pay, we went down Google route. Yeah. I uh, just want to check in and make sure that people remember, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we are happy to answer those as we go along. And so these here, really see them as being alternatives to your, your traditional in-house server. So traditionally, your server in the, in the dark and dingy room in the back of the office um, does your email, it does your file storage, um, and, you know, it might do a couple of other apps that you're using, whereas these are basically taking that same load off, but they're taking care of the, the backups and the data um, storage. They're providing you with all of that space for, for free, which is a, definitely a, a big win. Mm. So, and if we look at products, donations and discounts, now I've talked about connecting up here. Um, both Kat and I both used to work for Connecting Up back in the day. Um, Connecting Up is a nonprofit. They run donation programs. 
And as a nonprofit, they essentially run as a social enterprise. Uh, so when you get a software donation from them, um, they charge you a small administration fee on that donation program to make sure that that's sustainable. Um, the, uh, the software is all new software. Um, you know, it's not secondhand, it's not old versions or anything, anything obtuse. It's the, the current versions and all up to date. Um, and they also do new and refurbished computer and networking hardware, which will help you lower the um, cost of new hardware if you need to. Um, with larger organizations though, um, what we've typically found is that larger organizations have a bit more buying power um, and you might find that you actually don't, you can get things, new hardware, you can get cheaper through your vendor or pretty much the same price as connecting up. So definitely shop around a little bit um, and see what you need. But the other thing is vendors direct. So cloud software providers will often give discounts. Um, we have a big list that's coming soon to our blog. Um, but generally just ask the question. Um, there's an enormous number of providers that if you ask the question, they will provide something even if they don't have an official donation program. Um, for example, we do a lot of work with HubSpot. They don't have a nonprofit program, um, but we're always able to, to leverage our relationships with HubSpot to get the main nonprofit price on that. Now, does Vendors Direct only do nonprofit stuff? So vendor, when I say Vendors Direct, I mean going direct to somebody like Hootsuite or oh. uh, HubSpot or Refuel or you know, whoever it might be. Um, and you can always just do a Google search and to come up with the list that we've got coming out, I've literally just done a bit of a dive around. So what do they use? Okay, I know nonprofits use MailChimp. So let's do a Google and find out if we can, you know, get a MailChimp nonprofit discount. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. And Karen's all over that, looking at that. She loves asking for discounts. Um, and you know what? A lot of these providers actually love providing the discount and seeing how the nonprofits and, and how their systems are used for social good. So it's definitely no issue with doing that. Yeah, it makes them look good. Plus, I think they get a tax write-off for it too. Oh, well, I'm sure. I'm sure they get something. Yeah, it's a win on all sides. So just as a, a bit of an example here, I wanted to show some common product examples. Um, comparing what you would pay retail for some of these programs versus what you would get as an NFP rate. Um, and so if we look at something like Office 365, so the we mentioned before that that was $0, um, but if you had to buy that retail, the same plan is about $32 a month. Um, Windows 10 Pro, $250 retail. Through the nonprofit program, you can get that for about $18. Um, you know, the example cat gave before with office that's about 200 retail 38 nonprofit and so we often find that organizations like if they don't know that these programs exist they will go to like antivirus is a really good one a small organization will go to office works and buy norton for a hundred dollars um, through the nonprofit program they can get that for six um, so you can see there, like it, the savings stack up very um, <laughs> fast. Zero there actually has nothing to do with connecting up, um, but I've put that in there just to demonstrate that as a as a third party vendor, I guess they do provide a special price for nonprofits, um, and they basically got a twenty five percent discount um, for your nonprofit. Um, so though that chart there, that um, table there, basically covers what most organisations would be after to get started. Um, and then, yes, that discount is for all versions, Karen, um, even the, the big good ones. Um, they've got a, a zero for nonprofits page on their website. You can ask on that. So if you can get that kind of saving, some of those are per month, some of those are per user. 
you know, it changes your IT budgets quite dramatically and significantly decreases what you're spending on your IT. You know, and as some examples of other providers that are providing discounts, Buffer do 50% off, which is a social media tool. Um, Campaign Monitor offer 15% off their email tools. Canva do a free work account. Um, so you can have multiple staff in there and you can have people uh, making your social, um, your social assets in Canva. Um, SurveyMonkey, which is very popular, is 25% off. Um, Facebook Workplace, um, you know, there, there's a whole range of different discounts uh, available out there for different purposes, um, particularly with your, your social media and your marketing people as well. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying there on Hootsuite, 50% can still be very expensive for more than three users. Um, there are other providers out there, so Sprout Social do a non-profit discount as well. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but they do do one. Um, Buffer is potentially a good option, but it's not quite as good at listening as uh, Hootsuite. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough pill to swallow, but there are a few other alternatives out there. So it's about doing some research and seeing, seeing what you can find that might fit the bill. Particularly with the cloud, though, with most of these providers, they'll do a, a free trial anyway. Mm -hmm. so 7, 14, 30 days, whatever it might be. So you can give it a go and see if it works for your organization. All right. Um, we'll come back to software if we've got any other questions. I want to talk briefly about technical support. And this is what I was talking about before with, with the new models and the old models. So the old model might have been an hourly rate. For a lot of organizations, it was an hourly rate. So you pay for what you use. But really, if you think about it, the IT company has no incentive to fix the root cause of the issue. If they do fix the issue, they will basically earn less money for, for doing that. Um, but you also get your budgets to blow out because all of a sudden a, um, a server issue happens when you least expect it and it causes massive problems for your organization. So this is why I talk about that new model where I've kind of called it all you can eat because it's kind of the whole, you know, when I was a kid, we used to go to Sizzler and that was the best thing ever because they had the Sizzler bread um, and it was all you could eat. So basically it's a fixed price per user per month and your users can call as much as they like with most of these providers. So that actively incentivizes the IT company to keep things running smoothly because they don't want you calling all the time. You know, you don't want to be calling all the time either because you want to know that you don't have to, um, but you've got budget certainty. You know that you're spending, for a 10, a 10 user organization, you might be spending $500 a month on, on IT support. If you call that twice, it's probably basically the same amount as you would be paying on an hourly model, um, but you know that you've got that IT provider doing your updates, monitoring your systems, making sure that you're all good. All right, their, their success and their financial viability of your relationship is based around them providing a, uh, a good environment for you to work in. So I want to talk about a couple of case studies now, just looking at old models versus new models and how they work. So let's look at a, at a small community organization. So let's say that community organization is volunteer-based. Um, they don't have very many resources. They're probably using some free Gmail accounts, which is, which is fine. But then when that person leaves as a volunteer, no one knows the password and everybody loses access to the email. Um, they don't have any organization computers. The staff will use their own, um, which is great until something terrible happens. Um, and there's no file storage for volunteers on the committee. They just use their own computers and, and they do that that way. Um, now, this is a very, very common um, environment. And I worked with an organization last year that was in exactly this boat. Um, and unfortunately, the person who was their IT committee member slash volunteer passed away suddenly. Um, and he was using all his own computers um, 
he had all he was the only person with all the passwords um and this became a huge issue for the organization to try and take back ownership of their data and, and be able to use things accordingly so let's talk about how we so we did this with that organization um we implemented office 365 enterprise e1 plan so the free plan they used email and sharepoint for that example um, they had some training with their staff. Um, and then after that, they actually didn't need any support for a period of time. So they just didn't opt for, they weren't large enough to opt for the, the support model. So basically that, that cost them $1,200 to move to Office 365 and then to get the training in that. But that's a once off cost and then ongoing, they've actually got no costs. And they're a small enough organization that their support requirements were, were non-existent. And that's a really common scenario with organizations moving to the cloud. We're kind of emphasizing the fact here that you can still get IT support. And there are different models that you can get IT support through. But we find that a lot of organizations require dramatically less support once they move to the cloud. Because Microsoft are, are doing the maintenance on your, your Office 365 servers. Microsoft are doing the security patching and the updates on your, on your email server. So it definitely does change that conversation quite dramatically. Now, I'm going to talk about the Northern Territory Council of Social Service. Um, so they came to us with a bit of a problem. Their, their IT costs were escalating, and really they didn't know why. Um, the IT provider hadn't properly explained to them why the costs were increasing, um, but they had a remote server type environment that they, they had with their IT provider. Um, and they also, the Northern Territory Council Social Service have a, a Darwin office and an Alice Springs office. So the Alice Springs office had really poor connectivity to the server in Darwin. Um, and so there was high degree of, of dissatisfaction with the environment in Alice Springs. Um, so really the organization wanted to do something about it. Now, um, in the case of NTCOS, they did a Office 365 readiness assessment with connecting up and Info Exchange. Um, in their case, they had no internal IT management resources. So I agreed to, to be their contract IT manager to oversee the project and help them get to the other side. Refuel Creative is not, a, not an IT provider by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I really liked the organization and had the knowledge to help them, so I decided to do it. Uh, the IT provider implemented Office 365 Enterprise E1 uh, and transitioned them from a, uh, a, a hourly model with a server and uh, server management to an all-you-can-eat model. Um, and because the organization wanted to maintain that link with the IT provider, the IT provider was quite negotiable in that process. They handled the migration, so they got some work out of that. Um, new computers were purchased where, where required. There are a few that weren't required, but most of them were. Uh, and then the organization had Office 365 and Windows 10 training and change management so they could properly use the new environment. Now, this process, in the end, from start to finish, probably took about three months, including planning, implementation, and training and change management. So let's have a look at the IT budget here. So in this case, they had a remote desktop server. And they were paying server 16 grand a year for that. Um, they moved to Office 365, so no costs. Their IT provider was using um, Trend at $1,000 a year at the retail rate. Um, and we switched them over to Norton Internet Security through the Connecting Up program for $34. Uh, and then finally, the IT support. So they were paying $18,000 a year for an hourly rate model of IT support, which was actually 
a lot of that $18,000 was spent on issues with the remote desktop environment. Mm -hmm. So that remote desktop environment was expensive to start with, but then the additional support requirements were huge. Um, so afterwards, their per user model was five and a half thousand per year. So their IT costs going through this process dropped from thirty-eight thousand a year to five and a half thousand a year. So they saved thirty-three thousand dollars in the first year. Wow. Now that's that's a huge saving, but when you think about that saving, um, one of the one of the things that a lot of organisations have said to me, well, okay, that's great, but how much does that actually cost to do that? So you can see down the bottom there, they went through the entire process with their migration, their training, their new computers, their monitors, um, and we did buy Office Standard at that point. So we bought a retail, co we bought non-profit copies for each computer. So there was um, $12,500 worth of once-off costs um, required to save $30, $33,000 a year. So it's, they got payback in four months. Um, so for them, they were absolutely ecstatic. Um, and that environment also not just with even with the the per user model of support we we simply got to a point where they questioned whether they even needed it because they weren't using it um which is which is actually a great a great place to be in um so they've managed to get that bigger saving on their IT environment and they're still considering what to what to drop back further so even though the, the cost of doing like a, a $12,000 upgrade might seem like a lot, that money's already been spent over the course of a financial year. Um, and in a lot of cases, that money will be saved over the course of a financial year, the same financial year that you're doing the upgrade. So it's actually not as expensive a process as it might look like. So the outcomes here, like I said, limited use of IT support. They had very, very few support calls once the initial migration was complete and they had their training and they had an idea of what was going on. Um, significantly increased uptime and collaboration. So there were no server disconnections, which meant that the team were able to, to get more involved um, and they had real-time document editing, which is a massive saving for um, policy work, reporting, um, any document where multiple people in the organization will be working on it. Um, obviously, the significant cost savings, that's huge. Um, and then the additional, the improved scalability. So if the organization gets more funding, they're able to add staff at, at little to no cost. Um, so they're able to grow a lot better than they otherwise would be. And there is a question, how was the training delivered? So in this case, the training was delivered face to face. Um, even though they were in two different cities, uh, they took this as an opportunity to piggyback off of uh, um, other planning meetings that they would usually have. So everybody was in Darwin for the week and uh, we did the training face to face. These days, um, if I'm delivering training for this kind of thing, most of it would actually be over Zoom um, and I actually prefer doing it over Zoom because at the end of the training, we can provide the organization with a recording. You've actually got a function in Office 365 called Office 365 Video. You can put your recording in there for new staff um, because new staff are the ones that really need to be across how the system works. Um, yeah, I so Karen, I reckon my next case study might actually resonate with you because if you're migrating to SharePoint, there is going to be some change management and some support, some support required there. Um, in the first case, what we would really need to do is understand how you want people to be using SharePoint because it's a very flexible system that way. And then once you've worked out how you want people to use it, then we can train the the rest of the team in, in how to do that. Um, which brings me to my next example. So the YWCA of Darwin. Um, this, this organization was across about six offices, 
but they had their server in one office. Their internet connections were woeful. The phone system existed in one office, but not in any of the others. Um, the IT was very dysfunctional and so dysfunctional that they did a survey of their staff to work out what the biggest satisfaction, dissatisfaction was in the day-to-day -day work at YWCA. You know, were they, were they being paid enough? Was it um, clients they were working with, whatever it was? And all of them, or the majority of them, rated the IT problems as being a higher priority than their pay packets. Um, they had a server due for replacement. They had a large capital expense required to do that. So they knew that they, they weren't sure they wanted to do that. Um, their IT support was, it was ad hoc. The costs were just going up by the day. Um, because they were an organization with about 80 staff, um, they were having 30 hours of staff downtime per day across that 80 staff. They have people in 24 hour offices. So 30 hours per day, you know, if you can fix that and give an additional 30 hours of productivity into the organization per day, that makes a huge impact. Uh, and they knew that there was a problem and they really needed a solution badly. So they did an IT audit uh, and then looked at an implementation of the audit recommendations. Um, and this case study is a little bit self-serving because I did the IT audit, <laughs> um, but I think that the case study is still sound. So they transitioned to a new IT provider who had an all-you-could-eat type support model. Um, that new IT provider did the server migration, so they moved them over to Office 365, SharePoint, and in their case, we used Azure Active Directory as well, just to make sure that they could log into all the computers and, and passwords were centralized. They had new computers deployed across the organization, um, shared computers were desktops, and um, managers computers were laptops. Uh, the entire organization in shifts had Office 365 training. So we would do a half day at one office with half the staff. And then the second half of the day we would do with the other half of the staff. So they would basically roll that over. And then significant internet upgrades in every office. So every office went with Telstra managed MBN um, so that we could start to implement the phone systems across the organization. Now, if you've been shopping for IT components recently, this probably looks quite expensive. Um, and it kind of is. But first thing is they had no more downtime after they did this, this project. Um, and using Office 365, they were able to sync their documents and if the internet went down, the staff could still work. Whereas the old environment, if they weren't in the main, if they weren't in the office with the server, which was actually in one of the offices with the least amount of staff, um, they couldn't work at all. Staff of, uh, satisfaction with the IT went up quite dramatically and they had a lot more budget certainty because they knew how much they were going to be spending on IT every, uh, every year. Now, I haven't really talked about how much this project cost because they didn't want me to. Um, and it also was quite an expensive um, project just due to the sheer number of staff. Um, but if you consider that the saving, um, it, it actually came out to being roughly what they would spend in 12 months on IT. Um, they replaced every computer at the same time, so they had that spare hardware ready to go. Um, and uh, obviously they saved that 30 hours um, per day. So that's additional resourcing for their, their services, which was probably a better outcome yeah. um, as part of that. So there are a few ways that you can get help to, to transition on this journey. So the first one we suggest is you just talk to your IT provider if you've got one. So ask them about a, a flat rate or you could eat style support. Um, ask them if they know about the donations that, that you can get as a nonprofit. 
um, and ask them if they've got any experience with Office 365 or G Suite. My firm recommendation is if you're happy with your current IT provider, work with them to find a suitable solution. Um, sometimes these kind of relationships sour over time because, you know, the IT provider is not evolving and not providing the right level of support. So we need to kind of adjust it accordingly. Get independent advice. Um, the connecting up Office 365 readiness assessment through Info Exchange is a good way to get a bit of a baseline. Um, the Northern Territory government offers a business growth program. So you can have an in-depth IT audit conducted on site by a, um, a consultant who can assist. Uh, and my recommendation there, which might sound a little bit self-serving, but always look for a consultant who is not an IT provider. Um, and the simple reason for that is I've seen a few audits from people who are IT providers and they recommend a solution that only they can implement. Mm. Um, you really want a third party that's neutral, that's not angling for the business at the end of the at the end of the audit process. If you need an IT manager, then hire one. <laughs> and I know that that sounds a bit silly, but um, you can engage consultants like like us. Um, to assist with your project, and that doesn't actually have to be as expensive as you might think it is. Um, but it's also advantageous in that you've got the expertise you need when you need it, and then you just turn it off with no long-term liabilities. Um, we also find now increasingly that good IT providers uh, will offer a virtual CIO type role, and they are then invested in working with you to get the most out of your IT environment. Um, so that can be quite a good model and that's generally part of your IT management. So it's not an additional cost. Um, something definitely that should be asked of the IT provider and see how they can help. Um, the other option is a short term project officer with IT experience. Um, so again, that might be a good option for some organizations where they need somebody for a six month contract to walk them through this process or a three month contract, um, they get in there, they get the job done and um, with, and after that, they, they move on to their next contract. So I, I talk about these couple of models more from the perspective of lots of organizations think that an IT manager is beyond their means. Um, the one other model that I haven't got on this slide is that some organizations have started hiring shared resourcing IT managers. So if you have an IT man, like if you have an IT manager need and you have a couple of friendly organizations nearby, you might actually be able to hire, hire an IT manager that's then shared between three or four uh, organizations. You each get, you know, a day, a day and a half a week. Um, and that might be a very good model for, for some organizations. So, I mean, that's why, I, that's why I say that, you know, it is actually affordable. Um, ask for your nonprofit discounts. Um, the project office is a good option because it will take up a lot of the IT person's time, this kind of project. Um, at YWCA, the IT person was the CEO. So it took up a lot of her time. Um, in the case of NTCOS, they had a, um, uh, a operations person who it was part of their role, um, but that takes them off of their day to day if they have to focus on this IT process. So having somebody who can come in is, is beneficial. And the same thing with the consultant, the cost of the consultant may be justified through the reduced staff time. And you may also be eligible for a nonprofit discount on that as well. All right, so my, my last point here before we, we move on is um, I want to really sort of emphasize here that this can be done, it has been done. I've given you two case studies. Um, there is a cost to move like anything, but the return on investment can be had in as little as three to six months. 
so you can actually afford to do to do it and to do the costs involved um, there are huge benefits to be had in terms of cost saving staff satisfaction and staff efficiencies and you can find help to see you through the process you can do it so um before i hand over to cat uh, we got any last questions on the it oh no doesn't look like it all right over to you for your bit cat okay well unfortunately i don't have pretty slides like ryan did, did because i'm just I ran out of time, but I do have some notes to go over. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of the time, so I won't take up too much with this. But we wanted to look at not only how to wrap up and set yourself up with software and technology at the end of this financial year, but also to have a look at things and see how it's going for next financial year. Things like review your mission statement. The end of financial year is a really great time to look at what are we doing and what do we want to be doing? Is our mission statement still current? Does it still reflect the desires and motivations of the organization? Are you documenting your activities in a way that sell your mission? Because the mission statement isn't just something that lives on the website. It's a living organism and it needs to grow with your organization. And part of what we do with that mission statement is use that to find people to help support us in what it is that we want to do, especially as a not-for-profit. Uh, looking at your donor management, are you creating new relationships or are you only supporting and cultivating the current ones? Do you have an idea of who your ideal donor is? If not, can you define them or do you need help doing that? As all businesses and nonprofits technically are a business, you need to know who your ideal client is. And if you don't know who that is, it can be a real struggle to find uh, donations and support. A great place to start doing that is with your board. What does your board actually do? Are the members of the board making donations themselves? Are they networking on your behalf and the behalf of the organization, are they even hosting networking or fundraising events on behalf of the organization? So how involved are they and how committed are they to living the values of the organization? And then finally, looking at marketing. Does your marketing efforts reflect your values and mission? Because mission doesn't always equal financial donations, meaning people don't give money just because they sympathize with what your organization does. I mean, how many times do we see the videos and the commercials for the children who are starving in Africa? And as much as we sympathize with that and we want to see that end, we don't always necessarily instinctively reach for our wallet right that moment. So what are those things that you can do that it will connect people to your values and mission that will make them want to support your organization even more strongly? Uh, look at your current outreach efforts. What are you currently doing to reach out into the greater community and be part of the greater community? And how do you stand out and stand apart from other similar not-for-profit organizations who do similar things to what you do? And that comes back to that ideal donor, that ideal client in your marketing, because the more specific you can get to what you're doing and saying and who you're targeting, the more effective your efforts are going to be. A few things to keep in mind to look at going forward and to see where are you doing great? Do you feel like you're hitting those targets or where could you maybe even use a little bit of help and support? So that's pretty much it from my end of it. And we're bringing it in on time. So Ryan, I don't know if you're still there since we're really going to get the moment. No, uh, I was still okay. here, I gave you the floor. <laughs> Um, but just want to make sure if anybody has any other questions, um, that we're that we can answer before we wrap up. 
and otherwise just want to thank everyone for joining us today hope you found some value and some things that will help you wrap up this financial year and be excited going into next financial year <laughs> all right well i think karen looking at the questions i think we're all good and we're all done but yeah anything else comes up let us know on the facebook page and make sure you tune in next month um we've got uh full schedule for the rest of the year so keep an eye on the facebook page and you know what our topic is for next month i don't off the top of my head i, <laughs> I should have had that up <laughs> yeah well i'm looking very prepared at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yes no not not sure um, all right that's okay um keep an eye on the facebook page and you'll find out what the next month's event is and um make sure you register early yep definitely thank you oh, actually um maximize your impact how evidence-based design can help increase your productivity and well-being while working from home hey. and that's at 4 p.m on july 14th okay great all right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.